welcome to um, this webinar in the Cities Talk Nature Business Insights Series. This is um, a webinar um, organized by the EU research project Interlace. And uh, today our, our topic is uh, nature-based solutions, standards and certification. And we have, um, we're very lucky today to be in the same room um, doing a webinar, <laughs> which is fantastic. That's the joy of, uh, of having the speakers from the same city. Um, in the previous webinars, we've uh, been in different parts of the world. So we're really looking forward to, to this opportunity to share the space both physically and virtually with you to the, together today. And um, I'd just like to recall that this is the, the fifth of a series of six webinars that we've been conducting since last year on the topic of creating business opportunities for nature-based solutions and looking at the uh, barriers and enablers and uh, success stories, looking at uh, examples of how companies have have started up and uh, become successful, looking at uh, the role of nature-based solution labs for public-private innovation, looking at the importance of um, public procurement rules in generating uh, markets. And now we're, today we've gotten to the topic of the importance of standards and certification as a grounds for nature-based solution market creation. <clears throat> and we have one planned uh, webinar left um, this year to wrap up the whole thing and we'll come back a bit at the end to that. Um, you already know that the, the, uh, the webinar is being recorded, um, if, but if you have any problems with that, then you need to switch off your cameras and microphones. And just a very brief introduction to the topic today. Um, from the point of view of, uh, of the Interlace project, we've been uh, doing studies of the policy mix needed to um, incentivize nature-based solutions in cities and the sort of uh, framework that we've been working on in the research is uh, thinking about policies in terms of the legislative, regulatory or strategic instruments, the financial and economic instruments, the policy instruments to promote knowledge, communication and innovation, and also uh, policies around agreement-based um, and cooperative um, schemes where public and private sector collaborate. So the, today's topic, if we place it in that framework, is on the one hand, um, we're talking about certification. Let me see if that's not working. Uh, the animation, there we go. So today's topic is marrying uh, what authorities do in terms of um, setting standards for the uh, structural standards, design standards, or performance standards for nature-based solutions. And on the other hand, the uh, certifications for performance of nature-based solutions and how these two together act to facilitate market creation and uh, make it possible for the private sector to generate and provide solutions um, for nature-based solutions in, in our cities. And if we think about the topic in a, in a different way, um, of course, there's, uh, this is a dynamic situation. This graph is um, a bit conceptual, but bear with me. If we think about this space where we have an adoption curve of different projects <clears throat> that are more or less innovative in terms of the biodiversity and ecosystem service performance, uh, and that uh, the largest majority of projects, NBS projects, are at the back end of the curve with a relatively low biodiversity and ecosystem performance, um, then we are thinking about a combination of policies in which certification and standards play a role across all of the types of projects and companies participating in, in delivering nature-based solutions. The minimum performance standards are tools that municipalities can use to raise all boats, as we would say. And then certification systems play a role in um, more innovative, more competitive uh, actors that want to go beyond minimum standards. And what's driving certification systems are pilot projects and innovations that eventually um, generate or update certification. And then that trickles down into minimum performance standards. And so these things play together. And over time, the thinking is, and we'll see from Oslo that this can shift the adoption curve of 
nature-based solutions for the whole uh, city, the whole market um, over time. And the role of uh, um, regulatory authorities is also important. And one of the topics we can discuss today is the extent to which um, EU uh, uh, legislation like the EU taxonomy and sustainable activities, the extent to which it, it um, affects standards and certifi um, certification systems uh, directly, uh, for example, through investors or indirectly through the adoption of these um, um, taxonomies in national and municipal standards. And um, we have the opportunity today to discuss um, a few central questions. And these are questions that have um, asked the presenters to address. Um, and we'll come back to those. When you listen to the presentations, you can post questions in the chat. And um, as I only have one screen, I'm going to have to ask uh, um, our assistants for the conference today to uh, keep an eye on the chat and help me read out the questions. Um, but the questions for orienting the, the debate uh, around the presentations is what role do standards and certifications play in um, procurement of nature-based solutions? Uh, what role do they play in generating um, nature-based solutions that go beyond minimum standards in terms of performance? And do sustainability reporting requirements um, lead to market creation in Norway? And I think we'll be touching in on some of these things as, as we talk. And so the program today, after my introduction, is we'll first have Kristen Mollestar from the Tree Office, Tre Kontorda, and Rune Shaya will follow from Osplan Birk Foundation, and then I'll say some, some summing up comments, and we'll have a look at some, uh, some of the general questions to, to both presenters, and also the presenters can can share questions and question each other if they like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and like I said, uh, please post your questions in the chat and I need um, help um, uh, because I don't have a split screen today from, from James or Jagger to, to read out the questions to the presenters. And so um, it's uh, my pleasure. Um, I think I'm gonna have to introduce both uh, presenters and then we'll take them one after the other. Kristin Mollestar is a horticulturist and arborist with a career spanning two decades in ar 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 arboriculture. She's a consultant arborist at the Trekrun Kuntur AS, the, the tree office. She's recently written a book called Roots, a field guide for identification. And she's also been the, the uh, chairperson of the development of um, Standard Norway's uh, uh, standard for um, tree valuation, it should be mentioned. So welcome, Kristin. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, this is a so new dynamics. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and Viruna Shaya is a, a pioneer in nature-based urban development. Uh, he's responsible for urban ecology and sustainability systems at the Aspen Viak Foundation. And he also teaches courses at the Norwegian University of Life Science. And he's one of the contributors to developing um, uh, pilot projects and nature-based solutions, which, uh, as I said previously, trickle down then into different kinds of standards that have been used here in Norway. So I'd like to welcome you, Irun, as well. Right. <laughs> and actually, um, it's quite um, uh, quite fresh of me to, to welcome Irun, because we're actually in his offices today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so... I have now gotten through my questions. I realize I'm going to have to come back to those because we've got the presentations all in a, in a row now. So I'm going to just go through this. And uh, that was going to be my last slide for the, today. So now you've got that in advance. And I'm going to now give the word to Kristin. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. And thank you for inviting me. Yeah. I've got my presentation, City Talks Nature and the Tree Office with the with its English name of the uh, yeah, Konturet, but I'm not quite sure if you understand Norwegian, so I'll continue speaking in English, if that's okay. I assume yes on that one. So this is me. I am the CEO and the co-owner of uh, the Tree Office. I'm a kind of Greek in horticulture from 2001. I was a certified arborist in 2006 and 
and I'm also a track the three risk assessment qualification I have. And um, besides that, I have just written this book about three roots, which is uh, quite cool. I'll tell you a bit more about that afterwards. I am also the chair of the committee of the Norwegian Develop Norwegian Standard for Economic Valuation of the Trees. And I'm the chair of the Education Committee in the in a national industry association called Norsk Treatvei Forum or Norwegian Tree Care Forum. And I'm a teacher at um agriculture school on the West Coast. So that's me in some way, yeah. And um, the tree office. The tree office is, um, I would say, quite successful uh, business. It has grown up due to strict regulations around trees. And we started in Sweden in 2007 in Malmö. And now we have one office in Stockholm, started in 2023. And recently, we started now in 2024 in January in Oslo. So altogether we are 10 co-workers and we have clients all over Scandinavia, but of course primarily in Sweden and Norway. And we work with nature-based solution and we work with living trees. So trees are our nature-based solution. And I will continue to say we are working with living trees and but and recently, we also have to deal with kind of um, dead trees, but dead standing trees, because that's also part of new regulation. We have to take more care about them. So we work on larger scales. We work on areas and parks and cemeteries, and of course, individual trees and places. And we do a lot of training. So all the new rules and regulation that comes, we try to get ahead of them and maybe we can share our knowledge about them to other in the industry. So when we when we say large scales, we usually talk about cities. This is an example from Oslo, um, the, you can see here. So that's our definition of a large scale. We can also work a bit even larger, but that's usually what we talk about in large scales. And we do tree surveys. And we also work in smaller um, blocks, but tree surveys are more for, we can use that in larger scales and in block studies and one single tree. Yeah, this is um, an example for a medium-sized project or a quite big project actually, it's uh, the tree canopy analyzing. Here you see a city in Sweden and how we can uh, draw all the canopies and we can make different analyses out of, out of this. And this is how we work, inside and outside. Of course, this is a picture from inside, you see, we have lots of screens and data and we use all this information and get them and can give out reports to the customers, whatever they need. And we also work with iTree Echo. I guess this is quite familiar to some of you. So I won't go too much into the details. I'll go into the regulations afterwards. So, but this we did a quite big uh, job for Stavanger in this um, project, and of course, the benefit of trees. You may talk about the benefit of nature, but we usually just talk about the benefit of trees because that's our main subject. And this is a, a quite interesting topic because it's more known to people that trees have benefits and they want to know what benefits there are. So then they ask us to help them. What is the benefit of my tree? Or what is what are the benefits of all the trees we have in our street or in the city? And we can help with that. That's something we have been asked more and more to, to help out with these kind of projects. And we do to make the big scale down to the ground and to make it available for everybody and people that probably or maybe don't know so much about trees, we make these tree tags. So in this is a, like a poster you can have outside. It's not nailed to the tree, it's uh, 
in the proper way. Um, or is not stringed around the trees. But um, this uh, post will tell how much oxygen, oxygen the tree uh, makes and all the other benefits of a tree. So that you see there is a guy in the, in the middle of the picture. Maybe he wants to stop here and not look at his pad as it is, but uh, uh, read out this poster and that could give him a new, a new perspective of um, the living trees around in the city. So yeah, and we do a lot of uh, tree protect protecting plants. This we do because we have to do it, or not we have to do it, but the, the people that are going to build out anything in Oslo need to have a tree protect protection plan. And that is due to very strict regulation in the uh, building zone in Oslo city center. And this is more and more common all over Norway. If you're going to build anything, you need to know what kind of tree you have on your property and you need to have a protection plan so you can make sure that the trees you want to save actually will be saved during the whole project, also when you are on the building side of it. And here is a more detailed the tree protect pr protection plan. This is one tree and here you see different kinds of colors around the tree. And that explain where you can, where you have to be very careful, or where you can just put up a fence, or where there actually has to be an arborist or anyone around to see when uh, construction work is done. Uh, yeah. So, what role do norms and standard and certification play for us in the industry? And it does play a huge role for us. I will say it's it's our um, it's what we live of actually, more or less. Um, luckily, we are very happy to work with trees and all the strict regulation makes us uh, be able to save more trees. And then we maybe can save more nature. And this uh, strict rule that gives us a huge possibilities to make um, greener projects. And it's, we can use it as a tool, tool or, um, or uh, something we, uh, it's easier for us to say that um, uh, trees, one tree or thousand tree has to be saved because if you don't do that, you won't get uh, the project through in the, in the apply process in, for the commune or whatever you are where you're going to build. So um, ahead of um, in, in Norway we have done a, a, a great work on getting these two kinds of certifications implemented in the our industry and also into the communas. This is two types of certification for education of arboriculture. This is the certified arborist, is from um, the International Society of Arboriculture, and we have the European Tree Worker. And these two uh, examples of certifications, of, they tell you that if you, if you have one of the certification, you have a certain qualification and you are able to work with trees in a proper way, and you should know quite a lot about trees to work with them. And because uh, this um, um, uh, branch, uh, no, this um, tree organization. Mm -hmm. uh, the voluntary organization, Tree uh, Hairs, the work with Tree, have worked so hard to get those uh, certifications all over the, um, the Norwegian society or, or the Norwegian um, tree care society. It's now easier to do proper tree, tree care because the people that ask for the job knows about this and the people that do the job knows about this. And we also, because of this, we have also got a new education system in Norway for, um, for operates. And that's also our getting, so we get the level of the quality of the work for trees higher and higher and higher because we have all this uh, certifications. So that's really good. 
and luckily that helps us um, save more trees in the city. And here is a very new tool, tool I will say it's, it's a new standard for a tree evaluation in Norway. Uh, before we used the Danish standard for tree evaluation or the Swedish one, but now we have um, uh, got it into the Norwegian system, this, which is Norwegian standards. And here in Norway, Norwegian standard is more like something you should um, follow, or and in some cases you have to follow it. So. There is Norwegian standard for almost everything we are going to build. Or, so when we have this uh, for three evaluation, we are very happy because then lawyers and other that brings cases, three cases to the court, they can say, oh, have you done an evaluation of three? It's an economically or economic evaluation after the Norwegian standard, and um, then we will have um, the same level of the evaluation and it will be easier to understand what the economically value of the tree are, is. Um, and um, this evaluation, it, um, it tells you something about what the vitality of the tree, what the me mechanical stability of the tree, and uh, what is, uh, how many people are looking at this tree or is it a public tree or is it a private tree? And all those um, things make this evaluation and we have a, a, a line under and a sum of euro in the end. And this will be launched in March, I think. So we're looking very much forward to that. I will also say another, this is not a regulation, it's more like a um, collaboration between the municipality of Oslo and the city residents and business to increase tree planting in the city. And this project has um, had a very big effect on everybody in Oslo, or not everybody, but people that are concerned about trees and then the evaluation or then what tree actually means for the city. So this project has generating loads and loads of work for us because now um, and, and entrepreneurs and people that are going to build something, they are much more aware of the benefit of trees and benefit of big trees. So thanks to this, it's not like a standard or a rule, but it's more like an, something that's going on, um, a norm or something. It's, uh, it has been very helpful for our business, <laughs> actually, and also for the trees. And this one, 330-300, maybe you, you probably have heard of this before, because this is more like, um, how can you say this is a rule that has blown over all Europe, more or less. It's a very easy rule, and it says, in, sh in short text, it says that all residents should be able to see three trees from their window. There should be 3% tree canopy coverage in each residential area, and everyone should have maximum 300 meters from the nearest park or green space. And this rule is not a law or an act or a standard, but it's uh, been implemented in quite a lot of cities all around Europe. And it's uh, very easy to understand and it's easy to sell out to other municipality or building and developers. And they say, oh, 330, 300, that's easy. I understand, oh, that's good. So this rule have actually made us a whole new um, a line of services we can help with in our business. So we can we can create a planting a tree planting strategy, and we can uh, measure the canopy of the cover of a city, and we can provide analysis of how many people live within 300 meters of a green space, and if there is, uh, and then we can help them develop um, 
more green space if that's necessary. So this rule, or it could, maybe it will be standard in some cities, I actually think it will be, is a very helpful tool. Yeah, this is just an example of a tree planting campaign. Uh, we had, this was in, uh, in Malmö, uh, where we uh, analyzed a quite big uh, residential area and, find, and found lots of places where it was possible to, to build, it, to plant trees. And then we photoshopped mm -hmm. a tree into the, to the, um, the a possible place. So it's easy for the municipality to actually, oh, this could be cool. It, it's very easy to sell uh, in, inside the municipality as well. And, and that's actually an answer to uh, as number three, as a, we can create tree planting strategy and use, we use the GIST analysis to identify the, the places. And afterwards we went out to actually find, find a place, take a photo of it, and then back in the office, put a tree in this site and see, okay, this, this, this place, how you can have this site kind of tree, this, this size can grow here. And it, it, now the, the residential area, they have like a little booklet or a PDF where they can just look up, and if they get money, they can go out and plant a tree there. So it's easy for them to plant new trees in the right place. And this is also um, a result, or um, more or less a result of the tree 3300. It's a neighborhood forest. And the picture of the um, finished picture is, of course, an animation. It's not, fin it's not finished yet. <laughs> but there is a lot of people going out and um, and planting. And this is this this picture is from Marman, but we have had similar things in Oslo, not run by our company, but run by the commune. And it's part of um, the whole new, I think it's a more or less a new wave of how we think nature and how people can come out and actually plant trees outside and feel that they are a part of something important. It's, uh, it's very helpful. And this, this law, this is actually law, the Nature Diversity Act, year two, 2009 is the best year ever okay. for us. <laughs> it actually made it possible to take care of nature in a better way in Norway. And I have uh, marked out something. It's of course in Norwegian, so you probably can't read it, but it's about um, oak trees. We have a special law here now that says that all oaks over 200 centimeter in circle conference, one third of our ground are preserved. Or if they have a hollow, you can put a, a piece into a hole, then they're also preserved. And this law is because we have found out there are lots of insects and um, lysons and mosses living on the trees, uh, on, on the, um, the oak trees. And due to our um, history of exporting timber, we lack quite a lot of old trees. So that's why this law has actually come. And this has made a huge, huge um, development in our industry, I will say. I will show you one tree, for instance. This is a housing area, or it is a project. They were going to sell all the tree, but not this oak tree you see in the middle with the yellow circle around, because this oak tree was 200 centimeters and it had to be preserved. And luckily the architects and um, the owner found this tree very nice. So they actually, okay, we can do this. We can actually, we can save this. And in a way they were not allowed to sell it. So they had to save it. So there where we came in and say, okay, but we can help you with saving this tree. It's not built yet, but we will see what happens. But here is uh, some kind of drawings. This was the first drawing. And actually tried to, to, to draw the, the tree and the root zone. And you see it's quite close to the tree, but this is an early stage. So now we have actually moved the house a bit more away from the, from the, um, the, roots, the roots. And then 
Yeah, this is uh, this three, this three here is actually the reason why I wrote the book about the root identification, because we needed to find the roots for this tree, and we didn't know the difference between other kinds. Of, what does an oak root look like, and what does a pine root look like, and what does a birch root look like? We could we didn't have any tool that we could use out in the field to see which root was which. So we started to photograph them and made this um, this book, which had been yeah. I'm sure it's this one, <laughs> commercial. Uh, but this is very interesting because I have now been quite a lot uh, in, in different conferences and spoke about it. And this probably will be a new tool that you are others all over the world can use. Of course, we have to make it for different species. But so far, we have like 45 species, I think, something like that. Yeah, and there you see an, another example of uh, how this law, nature of acts, actually um, uh, is um, due to this uh, complicated uh, scenery. You see, there is this is an old tree. It, it's not an oak, it's um, Asia, Platinoides, which is native in Norway. And, they were going to save the tree and build a garage underneath. Of course, no problem. It could be, it's actually quite a big problem. And because they had to save the tree due to regulations, they used more like three, three extra months on this project and probably cost us a couple of millions more. And here is the result. Um, they had to take, uh, have a, um, column with five meters from the tree and they lose two parking lots but the, the tree still lives this is 10 years ago but it it loses one branch every year more or less more so it it, it dies more faster you can say something die fast or die slow it, it dies faster than it would die if this have, haven't hadn't happened but still this is actually an answer of how um, restrictions make um, building more complicated and uh, trying to combine the, the this is actually a nature a nature based solution but I'm not quite sure if it's a good nature based solution solution but it is one this is a try and I just want to show you this uh, photo here because here you see this is actually a historical um, uh, tree it's like history, but the, the funny thing is this picture here. Here you see that has taken away all the roots around. And um, yeah, the, the main thing here is actually something that we have seen that have, have been an uh, uh, increasing um, our services into the uh, into the tree is actually that we know that trees have roots. Not everybody knows this. Unluckily, <laughs> but uh, there has been a more awareness that actually trees do have something underneath the ground grow. And when you see a picture like this, you see, oh, this is quite a big root, and this is not this may be 80% of the root. Maybe there is a bit more. You see the man down there, so it's quite big. Yeah, here it is. And this is when it was moved to a new place. And it's it's alive. And this is also a nature-based solution for taking care of trees that otherwise would be felled and we would uh, lose quite a lot of years for this single tree. Yes, and um, due to strict regulations about preserving trees in the city, we also need to make sure that the trees we preserve are healthy enough and can, and can stand or not fall over due to rock or something that may give them bad vitality. So this is also a tool we use, it's a tom tomograph that show how much decay is inside a tree base. And, and this is actually quite uh, common to use for us because um, there are, if we can save an old tree instead of uh, planting new ones, we have, uh, saved a lot of carbon because the old if you should like uh, plant 
um, compare or um, compensate, you have to like like 200 new trees for one big trees, and you don't have room for that. And you don't have room for that when they are older either, because you don't just probably have room for one old tree and not 200. So the best the best solution the, the best solution for nature is to save the tree as long as possible. And this is a tool to make sure that the tree isn't so decayed that the owner may think it is. Yeah, and we do a lot of um, training uh, for um, um, and we have a lot of presentations to tell about our work to others. And we think this is a very good idea because the more people that know knows about um, trees and how to take care of them in the city, the better it is. And the better it is for us and for the industry and also for our resilient, resilient living people in the city. Yeah, <clears throat> this was uh, my presentation, and um, I hope you have some questions. That's fantastic. Um, we have, I can see in the chat, don't, don't leave. <laughs> yeah, but let's see, uh, here we have, uh, we have the chat, and I'm gonna, I haven't been able to uh, read it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, we have about, uh, Six, seven minutes. So, uh, and about eight questions. So, good afternoon. Is it possible to obtain an assistance certificate? Okay, I would appreciate that. Yes, you can contact the uh, the organizer of the seminar and they can uh, send you a, mm. a, a certificate. So, that wasn't a question to you. No, but you need it if you have like an ISA certification. <laughs> yeah, so that was, but it wasn't about the certification. No, no. Um, oh, is it possible to speak, speak close to the microphone? We didn't see that, sorry. Um, okay, here we have a question from Jesus Vasquez. Uh, ¿Qué tipos de árboles son los recomendables para ser sembrados y cómo se seleccionan? Sorry, David, you muted yourself there. There we are. Okay. Yeah, so the, the question in Spanish from Jesus is what kind of uh, trees are recommended uh, for planting and how do you select them? And I guess you'd have to answer that question specifically for us. <laughs> yeah, uh, we like to plant native trees in Oslo. That's also due to newer regulations, but that's uh, something to discuss actually because we have a, a, a warmer climate now than we had before and probably we need to plant non-native species as well but still the commune or if you are in a public area they recommend to play to to, to plant native species and we it's it's hard to say what kind of species we actually plant because we try to play plants as many as possible uh, so we have a huge brand of variation in case of um, of uh, diseases because we do have uh, some diseases here as well although not so much as I guess you have in Spain because we still have quite cold winter so kill that kills quite a lot of the diseases but we do have um, the Dutch elm disease and um and the disease goes on ash, for instance, and some some others. So instead of planting one street with just one tree, we try to recommend to plant as many different species as possible. And um, we also want to play some salix. It's not very common mm -hmm. to use that in the street, but it's very good for the biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Thanks. And yeah. there's quite actually uh, quite common now to to plant the pines in the street. That's yeah. new. And yeah. it, it actually looks very nice. And, and some of the pine planting has been very successful. And it's uh, it, it does give the green uh, greener look also in the winter. Mm. Of course, we're speaking to you now from Oslo, which is covered in snow. Um, some of you are, are calling from Latin America, and you might not have those conditions. It, 
looks like that was the only question we had. Um, all of the others are instructions or okay. requests yes. for certificates. But I, I have a I have a question myself um, because you mentioned that um, the uh, the standard for tree valuation, economic valuation of trees, is coming, and you were of course uh, uh, the chairperson for that um, committee. But how do you think, or, or will the standard change your business uh, of the tree office in any way? Oh, it will be a part of our services we will deliver to the customer. And we will change from using the the um, the Danish work, the Danish method that we have used now until the the Norwegian one. And I think that it will change the um, the industry uh, in a better way, so we can have uh, equal well valuation of trees um, all over us, not like we have today when there are lots of different kinds of evaluation economically. Where, where, valuation mm -hmm. and we have this um, arguing in court mm. so I hope we will have um, this standard will give good economic evaluation that we also can implement into the, um, the lawyers so that I also know about about this mm -hmm. so we have to teach them also to to, mm. to know about it, not to use it but know about it mm. so yes I think it will be a plus to our services that we will deliver mm -hmm. so that's very good fantastic so we'll we'll see uh we'll see at least 10 people working in the oslo office in a oh, short wow. enough time yeah <laughs> <laughs> <Don't hire me. laughs> great well i'd like to say um uh thank you very much to kirsten mollister for, for sharing standards and certification on trees in oslo and we have time for further questions at the end so please if you still have questions for her we can you can post them in the chat and we'll have a look at them again. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. And I would like to welcome Maroon Nashaya. Yeah, you've already heard about him. So I'm just going to give you the, the floor to your own office. Perfect. <laughs> Yes, uh, today I'm going to talk about um, how regulatory requirements and certification can contribute to development of beautiful, durable and resilient places that also help us through the climate and biodiversity crisis. So the question is like, are the nature-based solution profitable? Is there a market for this? What standards and certifications can promote these types of projects? And what is status quo in Norway? Uh, these are some of the questions I'm going to discuss with you. The project you see here uh, with this green roof uh, could never be possible without strict regulatory requirements and a desire for green certification. In this presentation, I will tell you more about this and other key factors for success with nature-based solutions. Um, I'm a landscape architect uh, with a national professional responsibility for urban ecology and sustainable systems in the Asplan Viak Foundation. Aspen Viak is a multidisciplinary foundation with over 1,200 employees and that has shaped Norwegian societies for more than 60 years. Seeking to be the foremost arena for sustainable societal development. And what is real interesting is like more than 4% of our turnover is going to for development of sustainable initiatives. That's more than, more than 5 million euros per year. Uh, in this company, I had this opportun uh, opportunity to develop my own field of uh, expertise. Like it's called urban ecology. Uh, maybe everyone has heard about some kind of urban ecology. But, it, but it's all about uh, optimizing ecosystems with a foundation in nature-based landscape planning and development to address critical global challenges. Uh, so it's, it's 
we have to like see both re resource and utilization and greenhouse gas emissions, climate adaptation, biodiversity and social sustainability all at once. That's uh, the pillars for all our work. Because uh, in our opinion, our cities, they are ecosystems. And the ecosystem, as you know, they are in crisis. Uh, like we are part of this local and global ecosystems that's currently in crisis. Uh, you have this unlimited land use change. You have resource extractions, uh, like and you have greenhouse gas emission and loss of biodiversity far beyond the Earth's capacity. And the challenge is, is significant with like sea levels uh, rising, floods, droughts, landslides. Uh, and uh, you also have uh, this, uh, but also in terms of uh, diminished hope for the future and increase, uh, increased social uh, disparities. So the question, this is my, <laughs> one of my sons, <laughs> uh, <three. laughs> uh, so the question is, it isn't really like, are we against or with nature because we, uh, we are a part of nature anyway. And uh, the nature is our most important defense mechanism uh, 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 to, to like to solve or against the uh, climate and uh, biodiversity, biodiversity crisis. Uh, so, so our goal is like to optimize our places to become beautiful, durable, and adaptable and sustainable ecosystems. So we. <laughs> We try like to, to manage the whole ecosystem and all ecosystem services at once. And that's quite challenging anyway. But uh, it's an interesting approach because I think it's maybe going to be like uh, it started. I think it's going to be a paradigm shift uh, in planning. Uh, I think we, in five years, maybe this is going to be more like the standard. Uh, and th this could just be like some uh, uh, some kind of fairy tale, but we have tried this approach in, in, in a lot of projects and many of them are built. So we're working with like large scale urban projects in Buda, Bergen, Oslo. Um, and we also have several uh, built projects and uh, we also uh, work close with the scientists all of the time. So now I'm going to tell a story about uh, this little fairy tale, a uh, small green roof in the center of Oslo. So this is real tiny in like the urban scale, if you see it here. And as almost all of my projects, they are built on gray sites. I, <laughs> I try to avoid anything who is, has ecological value. I try to avoid these areas and the people who wants to, to build them down. So this, this, uh, this has been uh, like gray for uh, more than 100 years. And uh, I was asked to join this project. And this is what, like the first and only urban ecology zoning plan in Norway. So um, the developer, he has to, <laughs> to be real, real ambitious to, to buy this, uh, this area and have to be real ambitious to, to develop the rest of the area. Uh, and he also have this, uh, he also wants to like to be the first uh, cultural building in Norway to have this Bream Nord certification, very good. Uh, and we have lots of uh, municipal requirements and guidelines in this project. But it was real interesting because uh, you can see like the CEO of uh, this firm, he was quite young, it was his first, <laughs> his first project as the CEO. Uh, so he just, uh, he asked if, uh, Rune, can you join me? And, um, and we started to talk about uh, like ecological approach and he was fascinated and he said, okay, you are going to drive the car, I'm going to follow you. So it was not, not a question about money. It was not a question about where we're going. We, we just tried to, to do something. Uh, but th this is uh, and what, in Norway called Dugnad. <laughs> it's uh, 
Norwegian work for a job which requires a significant amount of voluntary work for the greater good. So, so I, I just called like the best people I knew then uh, and asked if, if they want to join me in this project. So it was like scientists from um, Norwegian Institute of uh, Bio and Econ uh, Economy Research. And it was like scientists from Norwegian Water and Energy Directorate. And it was uh, professors from University of Life and Science and from the University of Oslo and uh, suppliers as well. And everyone likes to have a challenge. So the challenge uh, like uh, I gave them was that the first is climate change adaption. Uh, can you create the first blue green roof in Norway that can handle a 20 year future rain event? It's about uh, the, the rain and light, like it's Norway each 200 years right now. And researchers, can you create a lightweight soil mixture with a high degree of recycled materials? Because this, this uh, roof was never developed to be a green roof. So we have to have like real lightweight uh, materials, materials. And biodiversity, can you imitate nationally important biodiversity? So the plan was to like uh, move <laughs> everything was as more in the like, basin underground up to the roof to soil the stormwater challenges. So this this is like the work in progress <clears throat> with the stormwater management and design, uh, and it was uh, it was a bit challenging because uh, uh, one of the soil scientists from Nibio. <laughs> Uh, I heard that he said that uh, this uh, he, he saw the section and he said this is never going to work. <laughs> so I was quite stressed, uh, not angry, uh, but uh, we called all the people together and it was like uh, suppliers, uh, scientists, and uh, landscape architects, uh, water engineers, and we just drove what we uh, thought was the perfect <laughs> section right now. Uh, and and it was built like this, so uh, like more like a joke. I, I said I gave them two hours to find a solution, and they gave, and they did. So this is this is like the the planting plan. The the sign is real, uh, uh, real real uh, good landscape architects who I worked uh, work a lot with. Uh, who's like she designed this roof uh, together with scientists from uh, Nibu, Norwegian Institute of Bioeconomy. And they designed it to be both the hab like the habitat, <laughs> uh, and it it has to be beautiful at once. So it's like mimic of uh, uh, national important uh, nature based on uh, the roof's uh, carrying capacity. So here you can see it's it's quite easy. It's quite simple project uh, in if you see in this section is a uh, few elements and it's uh, it's it's just nature <laughs> pure nature and stormwater solutions it's not for, for uh, people it's just for scientists but uh, at that time it was it's very i think it's quite it's better now but it was quite challenging to get seeds and get plants from the oslo area uh so so uh, so we have to find a way to do it so uh, uh nibio norwegian institute of bioeconomy they helped us out they have uh, the, the researchers they collected seeds uh, in the in the Oslofjord area and we say we send it to hardanger in norway and it was nursed by turin Jumo, uh, who like grew them up and they returned to Vega Sena six months later as 7,200 plants. And we also have to do some research on the different kind of soil mixtures. Uh, who was uh, disturbed at the roof uh, in 2019. So it is lots of testing to make this work. And this is the roof two months after establishment. And you can see here, this is like the the, um, uh, the, the national uh, NVE, national 
uh, <laughs> well, well, water and energy uh, directorate mm -hmm. who has samplings here all the time. So it's you can give live data on what happened when it's right real uh, when it's a rain event. They have live data and, and at all events. So it's it's written uh, both the master thesis and PhDs about this roof. But we, we were not uh, prepared about this butterfly effect, and maybe that's why we heard today, uh, because it's what's uh, amount it's with lots of uh, attention, and it's like two two days a week. <laughs> Still, after so many years, we we talk about this roof, this small project, one of many, um, and it was describing like a taste of uh, like urban mega trend green mega trend um, in the newspapers <clears throat> and uh, the the soil mixture that that we developed it get uh, like international recognition uh, uh, and what lies approved like an um, innovation in the brim uh, international system uh, and it was nominated for the construction industry awards in 2019 and uh, we get the seat of Oslo Architecture Award and uh, the silver in the Scandinavian Championship about green roofs. Uh, and it was also embraced by both the suppliers who just started to uh, to sell this product. product. <laughs> so uh, they say that the, this roof is going to change the future of the construction industry. And I think it's uh, been built like tens and tens of thousand roofs afterwards uh, who is like blue green and uh, the municipality say that this kinds of solution can save them for billions of uh, uh, Norwegian krone. Uh, but the most in interesting uh, is like we still get live uh, data from the researchers and we uh, so it's like the Norwegian in uh, University of Life Science the Norwegian Water and Research and Energy Directorate and Norwegian Institute of Bioeconomy Research, all of them is still doing research on this roof. Uh, and it's interesting that uh, they have sampled, they, they started to sampling the planting when bef when they arrived at the, at the roof and uh, say we, uh, and sampled uh, the different kind of species. And now it's like more than 100 and 20 species who have moved in onto this roof and actually live there. So this is like the roof the first year. And this is the year later. And now it's something in between because um, because this is like more a dynamic landscape who is uh, is uh, it's both temperature weather uh, who's going to decide how it's going to look from year to year mm -hmm. so in this project i think we were quite lucky uh, because we, we we managed to create this first blue and green roof uh, that uh, really works and we created a light with soil mixture and we developed this unique Oslo nature, and this project also uh, became like Bream very good. But I, I think it's it's re real interesting that the the, uh, the roof is not watered or fertilized for more than four years, and, and <laughs> it was quite shocking for me when when I asked people who manage this roof. I have. Uh, uh, do do you water it or fertilize it? No. Uh, and and we, as I mentioned earlier, we have tested this approach in several projects, uh, both in like um, this uh, project in Buda uh, with uh, with a new. They moved the town because it's going to be a new airport in this area, uh, and in a new government quarter, and in uh, like. Um, different kinds of uh, large scale seafront project in Bergen and also in uh, different kind of feasibility studies. 
So th this is more like the little sister of Vega Sena, who's arrived like one or two years later. And then we use the solution. We have that Vega Sena with some different kinds of uh, vegetation and with uh, the, with the high attention on reuse because this was a reuse uh, building. So what you see in, in this floor is like this, uh, this building <laughs> have to be turned down. <laughs> So we use the facade at, as a floor in this project, and the water is managed under this floor. Um, and we started like uh, to do uh, to that uh, to do like uh, LCA, or uh, we we managed to sample how much uh, carbon can we capture, store, and reduce in our project. And in twenty eighteen, in this feasibility study, we we recognize that okay, we can sell, we we can reduce um, carbon emission with eighty percent by uh, focus on um, uh, a reuse of soil and uh, and reuse of materials. <clears throat> and right now we we working with all the roofs on the new government quarter uh, with blue and green roof uh, roofs and with all of it going to be all slow vegetation. So the new prime minister is going to have <laughs> like uh, uh, species from the Oslo Fjord uh, right outside uh, him or her's uh, office. So it's built in these days. And in this project, we also developed uh, soil mixtures that store and capture uh, uh, carbon in a project. Yes. So, and we also started with, uh, in this project with both, uh, uh, with urban ecology, uh, subsea as well uh, in this project. And it's, it's real interesting to work with. So this, this is like more like a fairy tale because in a feasibility study, we, when it should move the airport uh, closer to the sea and built a new city in the city of Buda here. So we said, okay, you can just do planting. Our plan is to like, you start to plan now, but plant now because it's going to be hundred years before it's going to be a new town. So we, you have to do different kind of habitats and stuff and just do it now. And uh, you can change between values that are real, uh, is going to be like permanent with real value, valuable for, um, oh. for uh, nature and uh, other areas who who's who's can be uh, transformed later. But what is really interesting that we, we worked for them later and this like we call it the fishbone this and it's going to stay as a, in, in as a master plan the last master plan I said was, was like you have this fishbone and you have this uh, green infrastructure so it's it's really interesting so th this is like from one of our projects uh, with um, research on circular soil mixtures tested uh, like over 30 different uh, just for roofs uh, and uh, make new uh, soil mixture just based on recycled materials. So why choose nature-based solution? <laughs> I actually asked the uh, chat GPT and it's not. <laughs> I know the scientists are not using it, but I, I, I asked it just to uh, uh, I, I, I think it's interesting how um, how uh, finance is using AI. Uh, so I, I tried to ask them, how can I manage to ask uh, a developer to embrace nature based solution? So it's strategically and economically beneficial to invest in an urban ecology approach from the beginning to minimize risk. I think that's important risk exploit market opportunities and to contribute to a positive reputation and social responsibility. And uh, and we, we, we are quite exciting now because we, in Norway, we, everybody talking about the EU taxonomy, but we, we don't know actually how much uh, it's going to, to impact. It's going to impact, but we have customers now um, today I get email from big landowners who say, "Okay, can you can you help us to approve that our uh, our uh, um, 
uh, our plots, our um, all our uh, all our eindomer, uh, <laughs> all our properties are like uh, is going to be like in the EU taxonomy approved. Uh, so it's it's lots of work coming, and the next next they asked us is can can we develop local nature on this uh, <laughs> on this uh, plus? So we, I think it's I think it's real interesting, uh, but we we don't know uh, really how it's going to be, and um, everybody talking about the sustainability goals as well, but uh, the biodiversity plan is real interesting. Uh, so right now I'm, I'm working for the authorities uh, who a program is called Future Built uh, to fulfill the biodiversity plan or framework uh, by making like um, nature based uh, calculator and stuff just to, to, to see that the projects can contribute to fulfill the plan. So how to succeed um uh, actually i have, <laughs> i have no idea but uh, maybe <laughs> uh I, I think the most important i think is like you have to build the projects or uh, develop the project with researchers on research and they have to be research afterwards and you have to share the knowledge uh, i think that's the most important that we have learned in our projects because Vegas and as I, I mentioned earlier it is for us it's like small projects uh, in in and then we, we used like maybe a year on the whole pro, uh, process but uh, when we involved all of the researchers and they could tell stories about how this actually worked or not work uh, and uh, and people write like, PhDs, PhDs and master thesis about it uh, and we said that everything is going to be shared uh, then it can uh, like contribute to develop uh, urban ecology and nature-based solutions so yes thank you okay thank you so much Aruna um, this is great um, let me see if I can now stop sharing and we'll see if we we have the chat, yeah. So we have uh, have no no further questions uh -huh. in, the, in the chat, <laughs> but I have a I have a question uh, for you, Runa. You, um, uh, Vegasena was this uh, pilot project, uh, and the uh, the question is, how have you seen that um, innovations that were tested in Vegasena, or have they been integrated into certifications or standards you mentioned the briam soil mm -hmm. mix as one example mm -hmm. uh, are there other examples of innovations in that project that have become mainstreamed and maybe even standardized yes i i, I think it's it's real um, <clears throat> it's really interesting because both uh, like um, the suppliers have standardized it and they sell it They're quite rich right now <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, the building owner has sell uh, the whole uh, building uh, a couple of years later and he <laughs> he told me he that you know i get six, 63 million um, uh, euros uh, <laughs> in my bank bank account now. I don't know what to do. <laughs> wow. uh, so so it it was quite pro profitable for for them as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but we we see that um, we the municipality we are we are involved everyone in this project and uh, as we talk about Christian talk about trees like uh, tell story about uh, these kinds of project. Uh, tell stories to uh, to the municipality uh, about this, uh, involve uh, researchers, so more and more know about it. And we can see like the regulatory is going, it changes uh, based on the result from these kinds of project, projects. Mm -hmm. uh, one example is uh, <clears throat> one of my colleagues, uh, she's working now in, um, in um, Oslo Kommune, uh, my earlier college. Uh, but but uh, we we work with like uh, blue and green uh, factor. What is it? A blue green factor. Yeah, yeah, blue and green factor uh, for future build. For so uh, we work together with uh, the municipality uh, future build program, 
I was like the project leader and I say, asked her, can we do this? Can we do this uh, based on these kinds of solution? And I said, why, why can't, why, why can't you like give more points for blue and green roofs than just the green roofs mm -hmm. uh, in, in this kinds of um, mm -hmm. blue and green factors uh, and, and other, um, uh, other subjects from our experience as well. And I see now where the municipality has uh, made a new uh, blue and green factor <laughs> pro uh, program and um, document. And I said they have integrated this in mm. this. So everybody in Oslo now, they can get extra points for uh, develop blue and green roofs. Mm. So, so, so we can example. see it, we yeah. can see it like everywhere. Mm. And for a couple of years ago, we was, we said that, okay, we, I mentioned it earlier, but we 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 make this LCA uh, or mm, uh, uh, life cycle life analysis LCA, for for, yeah. uh, mm. for landscape. I think we were with some of the first to develop it, mm -hmm. and and we asked like uh, uh, municipalities said uh, okay we have developed it. Can, uh, this could be interesting for you, uh, and they say okay this is interesting, and they mm -hmm. they make it like a part of their program. Okay. in future build and afterwards uh, Bergen Kommune mm. uh, said that this uh, this is going to be a part of uh, what we're actually going to <laughs> mm. to do in the future okay. uh, so, so integrated so that get plan. integrated mm. so so we see when we push these borders and we make a project and work with the innovation and show and like mm, share all of our knowledge it it's it pushes the borders all the way, mm. and it gives yeah. us more more work as well. Mm. <laughs> yeah. The pie gets bigger. That's great. I can see some questions coming in now, so uh, this is good. Um, so, uh, uh, the first question is: How is changing landscape on the roof perceived by stakeholders? Oh, uh, it's it's kind. Of... You mentioned it wasn't for people in your presentation. <laughs> no. No, as, as we, we have to uh, we have to talk to people and say that this is a part of Oslo nature uh, and it's going to look great some some parts of the year and it's going to 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 look uh, <laughs> um, to to be quite messy uh, other parts of the year mm. uh, but this is nature yeah uh, and if they if they know it, it it's it, they like recognize it they say that okay this is okay. Mm. Yeah, so we have uh, seasons in, in Norway. Um, yes. Here we have another question. It's in Spanish. Um, ¿Cuáles son los principales desafíos para la ecología urbana en un mundo cada vez más urbanizado? ¿Y cuáles son algunas soluciones potenciales para abordar estos desafíos? So the Jesús, again, very active, is asking, what are the main challenges for urban ecology in the world, in a world that's um, more and more urbanized? And what are some of the solutions to uh, to tackle this challenge? So that was the big question. Yes, yes. I don't know how to answer that yes. specifically. Uh, maybe in, in Oslo, uh, Oslo is a densifying city. Um, what are the main challenges of uh, for urban ecology in a densifying city? Yes. But um, uh, I think I think like I worked with uh, Christian in some uh, <laughs> some projects as well, like a Brim ecologist. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I'm the most strict on something uh, when, when I uh, give advices to, to the developers. And I always say that, and, and it, this is in urban areas, and I say, if you're going to be real ambitious, you, you have to have like 30%, like you said, mm -hmm. is going to be covered by with nature. Mm -hmm. And almost always they say, okay, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's interesting. And they say, uh, how? And uh, when we ask about how is it, you, you can work with building integrated nature. And we ask, okay, what about the roof? Oh, we haven't thought about the roof. Okay. And it's solution for the, this, we tell, tell, uh, tell them. So mm. so we in some of our projects now, it's going to I work with, with a large scale seafront project here in Oslo. Uh, it's, it's re really big uh, and then we're going to to do to do the same i hope we're going to have like 30 percent and we also have to to develop uh, habitats uh, 
subsea as well. Hmm. So we, we challenge them all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, at the new government quarter, I, I was uh, <laughs> I was also a, a bream ecologist. Mm -hmm. I say if if you're going to like if you're going to be like bream certificate uh, and uh, with the ecological uh, points, uh, then uh, fifty percent of all the roofs is going to be gr uh, green. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot challenging because I am always challenged about architects and <laughs> everybody challenged me uh, mm. on this. But as I, it, it it has to be that. Mm. But I get um I get help from the water engineers as well because they have to have this blue and green roof to mm. uh, because I also municipality have this restriction of how much water you can mm. uh, have in these pipes. But we, we, it's uh, it's more like an, uh, uh, yes, you, you have to, you have to fight for it. Mm. I also have one. You have a yeah. question. Yeah. No, uh, an answer or uh, yeah. what, what? Some of our problems is to get the new trees we plant to be old, because mm -hmm. usually the new trees we plant will be twenty years maximum. And then they will die or be felled for some reason. So that's actually a quite huge problem. So that's why we want to save as many old trees as possible. But we also try to develop solutions so that the new tree we plant also can be old for our kids and for the future. Mm. And, uh, I have a yeah. comment because it's really interesting. I I'm, think I'm going to... Uh... To make people hire Christian, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because uh, what we actually said to the developers now that you have to think about reuse of trees as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to hire an arborist to to check out how how many years have this tree left. Can can it be moved? Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's really interesting mm -hmm. to. I, I think we're more like in a paradigm shift mm -hmm. right now. Uh, I guess so. Yeah, and it, it it is possible to move trees. It is. It's challenging. It, it can be quite expensive, but expensive compared to what? Hmm. It's interesting. And it's also interesting to hear how the professionals across companies in Oslo provide each other with mutual technical and scientific support. Hmm. I can see we have a couple other questions here from Mamuka. I can't see the last name. Apologies. Are design details shared publicly or are they propri proprietary and cannot be shared? You mentioned something about the philosophy of us plan yes um, mm -hmm. and uh, Kristin, you showed that you're publishing all your work in terms of uh, books that are openly available mm -hmm. um, so maybe you could comment on the philosophy of both of your companies regarding um, propriety or public knowledge yes, yes. and I can, I can share it later on I, I, I'm not sure if it's on I think the... you need to get close to I, I'm yeah. not sure if uh, it, it's on um, in in English but we, we actually share all of the design um, details and uh, all the uh, vegetation and all the stuff about this uh, roof and um, the we share everything uh, from this roof so uh, mm. But it's on Norwegian, so maybe David could. <laughs> yeah, maybe the question is more about the principle yes. about yes. how it works in Norway with bit private business and public information. Yes, yes. Yeah. But uh, we, I talked with David about this earlier, and uh, I would talk about the firm as well. Is it, uh, is it like, is it clever to share everything, almost everything? <laughs> but uh, my experience is that it is. Because that we, if you push the border, you have to learn more yourself as well. Yeah, and in, in our company, we have the policy to share as much as possible. Uh, so we have put out a lot of um, photos and stuff like that on our website. And we see that sharing is helping uh, our business as well. And um, yeah, sharing is caring, I will say that. <laughs> so uh, I think the more we share, the better the future will be, because mm. I think that between you can sit on your own and do stuff and be very good, and you can be two together and be three more times good, or maybe fifth, um, ten more times good, because I think there is, uh, there is something developing between uh, the brains, and if you are two in a 
two people discussing things, mm. there will come a third or a fifth solution mm. just popping in. And that's popping in didn't wouldn't come when you are on your own. So that's some of the reason that we want to share as much as you can. And as you mentioned, David, it's interesting because uh, Christian and I, we were, we were in different companies, but we, we worked together before. And this week, maybe I work with people from like 20 different companies. Wow. Uh, and and th this is how we actually work mm. all the time. Mm. Yeah. Because the developer, they just pick pick what kind of expertise they really want. Mm. They don't pick a firm anymore. Mm. Or they just say, okay, mm. I want her, I want him. And uh, and then we work together mm. in, in projects. Yeah. So we, that's really good, nice to see and so great to be together to talk about this topic. <laughs> uh, um, I'm wondering what ChatGTP would say about whether sharing is good for business. <laughs> but uh, we did have a, a previous webinar um, where um, uh, where we also uh, talked to entrepreneurs who said that the sharing information grew their market much more than uh, trying to be the only one in a very small market. So that's mm -hmm. also another thing to consider. There's one more question here. Um, do you have any data of these kinds of projects, if these kinds of projects have created long-term green jobs? Both of you. Well, do you have any any information or any evidence that uh, the kind of projects you work in create uh, green jobs in the long term? Yes. Oh, I don't know if you, if you can see how many arborists there are in no way compared to what they were for like 20 years ago. If that's an evidence, then there is a good evidence because I think we are like more, um, maybe it's 100 arbors or something like that compared to none before wow. or one before. Mm. <laughs> so um, there is an industry in, in tree care, definitely, in a way that is a growing business. And it still will grow. I think we haven't we haven't got to the roof yet. No, <laughs> no. So that's maybe an evidence. Mm. Yeah. Yes, I, I think uh, we see like the the livers of uh, suppliers of the green roofs. They have grew grew a lot uh, the last two or three years. So mm. I think they have a lot to do, and it is lots of uh, green jobs as well. Mm. But I think it's, this is just the beginning mm. so but it, it would be interesting to have like numbers on it mm. yeah well this is great i think we're coming towards the end uh, of our um, allotted time we have five minutes left there aren't any uh, new questions i'd like to just give you the opportunity whether you'd like to ask each other a question before we close um You've worked together, so maybe you know each other's secrets. But, uh, <laughs> is there any business-related question you'd like to ask one another? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> okay, it doesn't have to be. <laughs> I, I'm really curious about how I, I met, um, uh, I worked with uh, uh, one from Oslo Tree that you presentation, presented earlier, Han Jonsru, uh, mm. this week. And she told like the story about uh, that uh, the trees we plant now is just going to be like in juvenile that they just like been 20 or 30 years but we all know that the tree in Norway like a pine tree could live for like 300 years and then die for 300 years mm -hmm. um so but our our, our, um, our municipalities and the developers are they aware, aware of this because I have... We... No, I do not think they are totally aware of this. Because when I have a project, I ask the developer, how many years are we going to plant this tree for? Mm. And they say, mm -hmm. mm. And I said, yeah, but if, if we have like 100 square meters of soil in the ground, this tree may be 100 years, can grow to be 100 years and maybe it can be older. But if you just give it like five square meters of soil, it won't be so so much older mm. and you also have to have the regulation of the area the tree are planted in so it won't be felt for some other reason mm. or, or there will come new pipes or whatever stuff that you mm. put in the ground mm. so i don't think they actually are aware of it but i think they're coming 
more aware of it. Yes, because mm. it's, it was quite shock for me when I, as a landscape architect, I started like to, to work with different kind of engineers. And they all always, when they talk about buildings, they talk about, oh, this building is going to last for 50 years. Yeah. And that's nothing. No. And what, what about the landscape? What about the roofs? What about mm. the, our environment? So uh, I think it's really interesting to have like a perspective who's far beyond this 50 years. Mm. Mm. Yeah. But if you're going to plan for city, city trees and or nature in the city that are going to be more than 20 years, mm. we have to, to uh, know that in the early stage of the planning. Mm. Mm. And the big change in in uh, in the last few years is that your kind of professions have become involved in the early planning stages whereas mm -hmm. before you came in too late yeah i yeah. have one question oh great yeah okay. what do you think of a um, native species in the city hmm. about native uh, um, native uh, native um, oh exotics exotic uh, exotic yes yeah. mm, it's really a really interesting topic because many talks about it mm. these days and uh, uh, many say that this may be the solution like to adapt to climate uh, changes mm. but um, uh, in the new uh, uh, you talk about um, a native uh, not invasive yeah. uh, species yes okay. yes so um, in this uh, criteria I developed for um, uh, for the municipalities and also right now uh, I allowed uh, like half of, I said that half of the species have to be native, after the species could be a native. Mm. None of them is going to be invasive. So mm. that, that's the rule because uh, it's both like uh, to, to climate change adaption and it, it's like, oh, and the suppliers, they have to have time to do this change. They, they don't have trees, bush, bushes and stuff today, mm. but uh, they can't deliver this. Uh, so so we we have fifty percent native, fifty percent native, none of them uh, invasive. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Great. Thank you so much for a, a debate. This is the first time in our webinar series that we've managed to join physically and have a debate at the end. I'm mm -hmm. super grateful that you took the time, <laughs> to, and we took the time to come to your office. Thank you, Runa, oh, okay. for giving us the space. Um, uh, so I'd like to say thank you for. Uh, you participating online in the webinar. We have uh, one webinar series, um, uh, one webinar left in the series. In one month's time, we're going to look back at the six webinars and discuss um, the combination of policies that can promote uh, nature-based solutions as private business opportunities uh, to sum up. Uh, and we're also going to present um, the, the publication of a report from the Interlace project, uh, looking at policies in three European cities and three Latin America cities on promoting uh, private business um, and nature-based solutions. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, also thank you to the team, James and Jagger um, in Opla, and uh, we'll see you in one month, hopefully. So have a nice evening or morning, wherever you are in the world. And um, I just want to read a couple of, uh, there's a couple of greetings. Thank you for excellent presentations and for sharing your knowledge from Mexico. Nice. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And also a message saying uh, greetings from Colombia. Oh. Yes. So you've had a big reach today. Oh. And thank you very much for those kind messages and we'll be seeing you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Bye.